Now we will do the 2023 AMC 10A problem 16 through 20. This problem is also in the AMC 12. In a table tennis tournament, every participant played every other participant exactly once. Although there were twice as many right-handed players as left-handed players, the number of games won by left-handed players was 40% more than the number of games won by right-handed players. There were no ties and no ambidextrous players. What is the total number of games played? Okay, so this is a very good example of solving a problem via process of elimination. Just like if we just try to go straight from the problem statement to the answer choices, it might be very hard to solve the problem. This is actually a pretty challenging problem, but we can take advantage of the answer choices here. So first, let's think about, uh, well, we aren't actually given a variable for the number of participants in the table tennis tournament. So let's make up one ourselves. Let's say there are N players in the table tennis tournament. Right. Well, then the total number of games played, since everybody is playing uh, everyone else exactly once and there were like no ties or whatever. Right. So there were N choose two total games played. So now what we can do is we can uh, reverse engineer the numbers um, that were present, like the number of players that give these number of numbers of games. For example, um, you might just know from memory that six choose two is equal to 15, so n equals six here, right? So we can just write down uh, our numbers of n n versus n choose two right here, right? So we write like, n, we make like a little table, like n of n choose two. So like we have uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, just do little computations. It's really not that hard to compute, right? So here we get one, uh, here we get, three, six, 10, 15, um, 21, 28, 36, 45, 55, and 66, right? So what we can tell here instantly is that for these numbers of uh, games played, they correspond to, so 15 games played means that there were six players, 36 games played means nine players, 45 uh, games played means there were 10 players, and 66 uh, games played means there were 12 players. And we've already eliminated 48 because 48 is not uh, a possible number for the total number of games played. Okay, so now from here, we read the rest of the problem statement. There were twice as many right-handed players as left-handed players. Notice it doesn't say one off from being twice, right? It says exactly twice. So what does this tell us? Well, if, there, if the ratio of right-handed players to left-handed players was two to one, that means that there must be a total, uh, like a total number of players that was a multiple of three, right? Because if the number of left-handed players was K, then the number of right-handed players would be 2K, and then in total, there would be 3K players. So that instantly eliminates choice C, right? Because uh, the number of players has to be uh, a multiple of three, right? So now, finally, the next, the, the, the last statement, the, the, the number of games won by left-handed players was 40% more than the number of games won by right-handed players. And notice that this statement here in parentheses, there were no ties and no ambidextrous players, implies to us that every single game was either a win from a left-handed player or a win from a right-handed player. So if we write this down in terms of uh, constants like K, for example, right? So the number of games uh, won by right-handed players, let's say that that was uh, X. So we can use a different color. So the X games were won by right-handed players. Then that means that 1.4 times X games were won by left-handed players, right? So what is the minimum constant we can multiply uh, 1.4 by to give us an integer, right? We can multiply by five. So essentially we get that the ratio of games won by right-handed players to left-handed players has to be in, in a five to seven ratio, right? So they must be expressible as numbers of the form 5x and 7x. And combining these two numbers gives us 12x, which implies to us that um, the number of total games played has to be a multiple of 12, or else we couldn't split it in a five to seven ratio like this. And lo and behold, if we look, 15, not a multiple of 12, 66, not a multiple of 12. So our answer has to be B, 36. Let A, B, C, D be a rectangle with A, B equals 30 and B, C equals 28. Points P and Q lie on B, C and C, D respectively so that all sides of A, B, P, P, C, Q and Q, D, A have integer lengths. What is the perimeter of A, P, Q? 
Okay, so um, let's draw our little rectangle here. So just like that. So we label it like this. So we have A, B, C, D, and we have um, point P and point uh, Q, let's just say. Okay, so now we draw in lines AP, QP, and AQ. So the problem statement is saying that the side lengths of ABP, PCQ, and QDA have integer lengths, which is essentially the equivalent of saying that every single length in this uh, in this diagram is an integer, right? So we have 30 by 28 rectangle. Uh, these lengths are all integers, and the legs of the right triangles are all integers. So basically, you have integers, integers, integers. Okay, so we have to start somewhere. So clearly, uh, the, the point of this problem is that we're going to like set up equations with Pythagorean triples relating to each other, and there's only going to be one integer solution, right? So let's just say um, that this length here is x, this length here is y. So we're just going to start with this triangle, PAB, um, and we're going to look for all solutions, x, y, to um, y squared minus x squared equals 900. So let's write this up here, y squared minus x squared is equal to 900. And the reason why we're starting with uh, 900 here is because uh, we're gonna see there's a very important property of uh, this number, which is specifically that it has, so if we factorize it, there is a two squared in its uh, prime factorization, which is important for reducing the number of cases we have to look at. So that's why we're starting here. So anyways, we factor this as y plus x times y minus x. And that is equal to uh, the product of two factors of 900 that multiply together to make 900. So now the reason why the two squared here is very important is that notice that, so so if we try to uh, assign these two numbers like factors, right? So like for, this is obviously the larger number, this is the smaller number. So this could be 900 and this could be one, right? Except it can't, why? Well, because if we add these two numbers together, right? We got two y. So these two numbers should sum to an even number. So now we see the importance of this two squared term in the prime factorization. It forces that each of these two factors, y plus x and y minus x, have to contain exactly one, two in it. Why? Well, one of them has to be even, right? We can't have both of these be odd or else they'd multiply to an odd number. And if one of them is odd and the other one is even, then uh, like as we just showed, adding them together should give an even number to y, but they add together to be odd, right? So essentially what we've shown is y plus x and y minus x both have to be even. So they both have to have a factor of two. So what are the stipulations beyond that, right? Like why can't we just have uh, any combination of threes and fives here? Like for example, two times three squared times five squared and two. So why can't y plus x be 450 and y minus x be two? Well, the key thing you'll see here, oh, oops, the, the rectangle got erased. Um, okay, uh, so why can't, for example, this number be 450 and this number be two, right? Well, it's because when we try to solve for the number X, so we subtract two from 450 and we divide by two, right? We get 448 over two, so 224. So notice P is on length BC, right? It says P is on BC, right? Like the segment. So obviously this length cannot be 224. That would go completely off the rectangle. So we kind of have our second requirement is that these two numbers here, so the, the y plus x and y minus x have to be very close to each other, right? So we can try different possibilities of factors, but we'll soon see uh, just by guess and check, there's only a total of like how many ways? Um, a total of um, at most like nine ways to distribute these two factors, right? Um, no, matter, no matter how you distribute them, there's only one way to distribute them that gives you as X a positive integer value that doesn't exceed 28. And that's by assigning five squared here and three squared here, right? Any, any other combination will exceed it, right? Like for example, we, the, the, the second place, right? For uh, closest together would be two times three squared times five. And over here, two times five, right? But here we got 10. Here we would get 90 and we get uh, X as like the difference between these 80 over 240, right? Which is still a bit off. It would be like here, right? So these two, the, these two represent the closest we can get them to each other, right? At 50 and 18. Those are the closest two factors we can pick. And uh, by solving for X here, we get that X is 50 minus 18 over 2 
is equal to um, 32 over 2 is 16. So we add that on over here. So 16, oops, 16. And here we can solve, we just got 34. All right, so we've successfully solved for the two lengths PB and PA. And from here, it gets a lot easier, right? Because this length is 12. And now we're already uh, very limited on uh, what lengths QC can be, right? So there's essentially three different possibilities for us to try. So the first one we might try is a 5, 12, 13 triangle, um, which, which uh, like just uh, we're trying different types of triangles for a PQC. So we try a 5, 12, 13 triangle, um, but 25, 28, that does not make uh, AQ have an integer side length. So that just simply doesn't work. The next thing we might try is 12, 16, and then 20, right? That's a, that's a 3, 4, 5 triangle scaled up by a factor of 4. But then we get over here 14, and then 14, 28, that will not give an integer side length for AQ either. So the last thing we'll try is three, four, five triangle, but in the other direction, this is nine. So the ratio is in reverse. So nine is the shorter leg this time, nine, 12, 15. And we get over here 21. And sure enough, this is also a three, four, five right triangle. 21 to 28 is a three to four ratio. So over here, we just get 35. So we have successfully found um, the set of integer side lengths we assign uh, throughout the rectangle in order to give uh, integer side lengths to everything. And now the what we're looking for is just the perimeter of APQ. And we can just calculate this, add up 35 plus 34 plus 15, and it just gives us 84A. A rhombic dodecahedron is a convex polygon where each of the 12 faces is a rhombus, and all of the faces are congruent to each other. The number of edges that meet at a vertex is either three or four, depending on the vertex, what is the number of vertices at which exactly three edges meet? Okay, so this is an example of a solid problem in which we are going to use uh, like one equation here, the common, the well-known uh, Euler's formula F plus V minus E equals two, right? So this, this applies to any polyhedron. For example, uh, in a tetrahedron, the number of faces is four, the number of vertices is four, the number of edges is six. So it checks out in a cube, number of faces is six, number of vertices, eight, number of edges, 12, it checks out. You can try this for any polyhedra you like. Uh, this is a very simpler, uh, simple uh, theorem, F plus V minus E equals two. So F is faces, V is vertices, E is edges. So we're gonna use that to solve the problem here. Okay, so we're given that uh, there are 12 faces and they're all rhombi, right? So we, we know that there are 12 faces. So F equals 12. Also, we know that we can we can deduce the number of edges in the solid, right? So there are 12 faces, and each of them is a rhombus. So in total, there is a total of 12 times 4 equal to 48 edges in our polyhedron. Um, but there's, of course, one problem, which is that we are double counting edges, mainly uh, in a polyhedron, right? We have We always have two faces meeting at an edge, right? So essentially, every edge in the polyhedron represents two edges, an edge of this rhombus, right, on the left, and the edge of this rhombus on the right. So we're double counting. We're, we're counting by uh, up by a factor of two exactly. So 12 times 4 equals 48 is the number of edges in all the rhombi separately. But when we put them together, uh, the number of edges gets exactly halved, so it gets turned into 24. So E equals 24. And from here, plugging into this equation, we just derive that V equals 14. And now, using a similar argument to what we just did with the edges, right, that uh, every two faces meets at exactly one edge, we will now um, figure out with a system of equations the number of vertices at which exactly three edges meet. So essentially, let's let X be uh, the number of vertices at which three edges meet. So the number of three edges meeting at a vertex. So notice three edges meeting at a vertex. If three edges meet at a vertex, that's the same thing as three faces meeting at a vertex, right? There's three faces meeting here, one, two, and like three on the backside, right? And four, similarly, four edges meeting at a vertex is the same thing as just saying four faces are meeting at that vertex. Uh, so, so four edges meeting at a vertex, number uh, of that is Y. So in total, the, the X plus Y should just be 
the number of total vertices, right? Because every single, it says right here, the number of edges that meet at a vertex is either three or four. So X plus Y should account for all the vertices. So X plus Y equals 14. And then uh, finally, what we look at is, so so uh, we create like a sort of equation that represents, so how, what are the two different, what, what what is the way that we can count the number of vertices in the figure other than just using V equals 14, right? Well, let's think about it. In total, there are, so each rhombus has four vertices and there are 12 of them. So in total, there should be 12 times four equals 48 vertices, except we are double counting, right? Because uh, what's actually happening is at every single one of the vertices where three of the rhombi are meeting together, right? That is uh, triple counting. And at every vertice where four of them are meeting, right? So four of them meeting, we are quadruple counting, right? Because all four of the vertices the vertices of this rhombus, vertice of this rhombus, vertice of this rhombus, vertice of this rhombus are all just converging out this one point, right? So what does this equate to? Well, essentially, how do we account for all 48 of these missing vertices, right? Well, at every one of the X vertices that have three faces meeting, that is a total of three vertices, right, of the rhombi. And for every, uh, oh, sorry, E plus, and then for every one of the Y vertices where four of them meet, that should be multiplied by four because there's four total vertices overlapping there. And when we do that, we should be triple counting and quadruple counting or, or whatever in order to get the total number of vertices with uh, multipli multiplicity, which is 48, as we just found, 12 times 4, 48. So that gives us our second equation here, 3x plus 4y is equal to 48. And now, finally, we can just solve for x by multiplying this equation by 4 we get 4x plus 4y is equal to 56. And subtracting these two equations from each other, we just get x is equal to 8. So 8 vertices have three edges meeting. And that's our answer, D. The line segment from A, 1, 2 to B, 3, 3 can be transformed to the line segment from A prime, 3, 1 to B prime, 4, 3, sending A to A prime and B to B prime by a rotation centered at the point P, S, T. What is the absolute difference between S and T? Okay. So let's draw our points. So we have right here, this is our origin, 0, 0. So we have uh, the point A, 1, 2. Let's just say it's like right here, 1, 2. Here's our A. We have B, 3, 3. So it's like right about here. So this is just, we're, we're not exactly, of course, this isn't a coordinate graph. We're just trying to like make a sketch of where the points are so we can kind of understand where P should be, right? So A prime is 3, 1. So it would be right about here. So A prime, 3, 1. And we have B prime, 4, 3, which is right here. So now we think about how this like segment would rotate over to this segment. Well, clearly, the center uh, would have to be somewhere around like here-ish, right? In order for us to like this triangle, right, gets rotated over to this triangle, right? So that's about where our point P is, right? We kind of just guess with like a sketch or so. Um, we can uh, move these coordinates over. Oh, oops, never mind. <laughs> okay, but anyways, um, so now we just need to deduce uh how how we can figure out p given our four points a, b, a prime, and b prime. All right, so there's one key thing we have to remember about rotations, which is that uh if we rotate, so if we rotate a about point p to a prime, notice that we're rotating, it's like a circular rotation. It's a circular sweeping motion. What do we know about circles? It's like equal radii throughout. So essentially PA equals PA prime, right? This is a like basically just a fundamental theorem about how rotations work. The like final point that we get should be the same distance from the center of rotation as the original point. So we have uh, the two things, the two facts we need in order to actually find P, which is uh, the first thing is that P A equals P A prime. And the second thing is that P B equals P B prime. 
So essentially, now we boiled down the problem to what is the intersection of the perpendicular bisectors of A, A prime and B, B prime. Once we find that intersection of perpendicular bisectors, right, perpendicular bisector of B, B prime, perpendicular bisector of uh, A, A prime, and they intersect right at point P. Okay, so the easier one to find is the perpendicular bisector of B, B prime, right? So uh, we're given S comma T as point P. Um, t those can get confusing. They look like five and a plus sign. So I'm just going to use X comma Y, you know, trust the X and Y. So P is X comma Y. All right, so what this tells us, um, so PB equals PB prime. Notice that the perpendicular bisector, it, it's perpendicular to this segment connecting three comma three and four comma three. But those two uh, points, B and B prime, are both at Y position three, which means that this line connecting B and B prime is completely horizontal, which means the, the perpendicular bisector of BB prime is going to be completely vertical, right? And of course, it's right uh, passing through here, uh, this point, seven halves, comma three, right, as the midpoint of B, uh, B and B prime, right, B, B prime, the midpoint is seven half, comma three, and it's just completely vertical, which means that the X value won't change. So essentially, all this summarizes to be that the perpendicular bisector just has the formula X equals seven halves. Okay, so then uh, we move on to PA equals PA prime, which is a bit harder to find. In fact, I'll actually um, just erase uh, most of this, like I'll erase B and B prime, just to make things clearer. Okay, so we can see better. Okay, so once again, we first find this midpoint of AA prime, right? Um, so this midpoint is just gonna be two comma because that's the average of one and three and two and one average to be three halves. So that's what that midpoint is. And then now we look at the slope. So in the other one, B and B prime, right? The slope of BB prime was zero. So uh, the slope of the perpendicular bisector, it was vertical. But in this case, it's of course, it's at an angle. So we can't just do it that easily, right? We have to actually use rise over run between A and A prime, right? We get that the total slope is one over negative two, right? By rise over run, um, we get negative one half is the slope of A A prime, which means the slope of this perpendicular bisector is negative one over that slope, which is two. So the slope of this is two and it passes through two comma three halves. So we can just use point slope form y minus three halves is equal to two times, um, and then x minus two. So now we're given x, we, this equation is not, it's not only, it's not only a vertical line, but it also just straight up tells us what the x coordinate is. So that's very helpful. And now all we have to do to find y is plug the x coordinate into this equation. So, but when we do that, we get y minus three halves is equal to, and then here x minus two, seven halves minus two, uh, gives us three halves multiplied by two gives us three. So then y just becomes equal to nine halves. So it's seven halves comma nine halves. P is the point seven halves comma nine halves. And the absolute difference between the x coordinate and y coordinate is just one. That's E. Each square in a three by three grid of squares is colored red, white, blue, or green, so that every two by two square contains one square of each color. One such coloring is shown on the right below. How many different colorings are possible? All right, so this question is actually uh, much more simple than it looks because there's a sort of symmetry between the four colors, red, white, blue, and green, right? There's nothing special about any one of the four of them. So essentially what we do is we just pick a random permutation of them, right? So in these first four squares, we just randomly assign them, right? So this could be green, this could be blue, this could be red, this could be white, right? Or any one of the four factorial ways. So four factorial ways to arrange these four colors. It doesn't matter what, right? It's like without loss of generality, we just give it a random permutation. Now we uh, use logic in order for these four squares to have one, yeah, one of each color, we have to have these two squares in some order have W and G, what, white and green. And here, they must have white and blue. So there's four different ways to uh, choose that, right? Because there's two ways to decide on the order of these two and two ways to decide on the order of these two, right? We don't know which order, right? Except there is one exception, which is that we can't have both of these squares be white, right? If both of these squares are white, then we have two whites and a red in this two by two square, which is already like a contradiction with us trying to color it in a certain way. However, all of the other three ways, right, give us exactly one position, like it gives us exactly one color to fill this in with, right? Like for example, so any uh, any uh, coloring that doesn't make both of these two squares white, 
or for any, if we chose a different permutation here, where like, for example, here, right, if we chose blue, red, green, white in the example position, then we, all we would have, we would be able to shuffle blue and green here and red and blue here uh, in any one of uh, the four minus one ways, because we have to subtract one because there's that one position where these are both blue, right? So similarly here, uh, there's three ways to do it. So I can show just one, for example, we can make this blue and white and then make this green and white for example, right? And then this last square, it's it's determined by these three. We already colored them in, so it just becomes blue, right? And uh, there are three different ways to do that after we do the first four factorial. So we just evaluate this to get the number of different colorings possible. And four factorial is just 24. 24 times three is 72, and that's choice D. And um, these are the latest books from Mattopia. In order to prepare for the AMCs, uh, you can go to mattopia.com slash mt-press to check them out.